I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness, right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. <laughs> Hello! Hello, 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 hello! Hello, 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 hello! Well, little Miss Honey, how are you today? I feel just wonderful, and I know a riddle. You do? What is it? What goes up the chimney down, but won't go down the chimney up? Uh, I give up. What is it? An umbrella. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Where did you learn that? Oh, I just heard it. Now, please read the funnies to me. Puck the Comic Weekly? Very well, I will in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man with something interesting to say. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. So spread out the funnies before you, everyone. And here on the top of the first page is Snookum. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Diddly da, diddly do, wickamackamookums. Let's have a little tune for little Snookums. Archie hears a terrible racket and dashes into the room. Finds Snookums with his hammer in his hand and a beautiful jar smashed to pieces on the floor. And Archie exclaims, Oh, Snookums, you bad, bad boy. Don't be so destructive. A hammer is used to build things in the world. Now, I want you to remember that. Snookums looks at Archie very thoughtfully, and Archie goes on. Now, I want you to go to your room and think over what I told you. Snookums turns around to go to his room, last picture, top row, and he cries. No, nobody loves me anymore. Oh, <laughs> First picture next row, Rosie tells Archie about a movie at the neighborhood theater. Archie smiles happily and says, Well, let's go. And he sticks his hand in his pocket and exclaims, Uh-oh, I forgot. I treated the boss to a hot fudge sundae and I haven't got a cent left. And he thinks. And thinks. And suddenly an idea pops into his mind. And last picture, Snookums hears some hammering. He looks into the other room to see what's going on. And he finds Archie with a hammer in his hand trying to break open Snookum's piggy bank. And Snookum says, And what are you doing, Daddy? Building another world? And Archie replies, Snookums, don't be so inquisitive. Oh, that Archie. <laughs> He's going to try to break open Snookum's piggy bank to get the money out. Yes, I'm afraid so. <laughs> on him after telling Snookums not to break things, then Archie does it himself. Yes, he's not setting Snookums a very good example, is he? I should say not. Shame on him. Well, now shall we see what's happening to Flash Gordon? Oh, yes. Last week, Flash was locked in jail by Zinn. But Flash has learned that Dale is still alive. So in the middle of the night, Flash begins to make a tunnel to dig his way out of jail. Please, let's read and see whether he gets out. Very well. Here we go over to page two of Puck the Comic Weekly with Flash Gordon. Rega rega doon doon, Saskimatash. Let's have music for Heroic Flash. <laughs> Flash is successful in tunneling his way out of the jail that Zinn has locked him in. He slips out of the tunnel and, searching for Dale, slips into Zinn's prison gardens. Immediately, he sees from behind by a pair of strong hands. But Flash is not so easy to capture. He turns to counterattack, but stops short exclaims, why, a girl. Listen, don't call for help. I'm no prowler. I'm Flash Gordon. I came to rescue Dale. Where is she? The beautiful girl makes an exclamation of surprise, for she recognizes his name. She tells him her name is Larga, that she's sister of Loyo, who Flash had saved before, and she offers to help him. She shows him Dale's cell and points out a guard standing before it, quiet as a cat. Flash steals toward the guard. Then, first picture, bottom row, springs on him like a tiger. He knocks the guard out. And a second later, has opened the door to Dale's cell. Dale comes out and stares at Flash unbelievingly. She 
She tells him she thought that Zinn had turned him into a slave zombie. Flash Miles. Yeah, Zinn thought so, too. Well, we'll have news for him. But first, let's get out of here. Larga suggests that they can hide with her brother, who is now a fugitive from Zane's chain gang of automatons. So last picture, Flash leads them through the tunnel, past the electron fence. <laughs> wonderful that Larga happened to be there? Yes. Well, now let's hope that they find Loyo without any more trouble. Oh, I hope so. Now please read Dick's Adventures, which is right across the page. Oh, I certainly will. Because I'm very anxious to know what's going to happen. Dick is with Paul Revere in the early days of America, and he was driving a team of horses, and I just love horses. Mm -hmm. And in the wagon, hidden under the straw, are boxes of guns and bullets that Paul Revere is delivering to the people in Lexington, a town near Boston. And a soldier stopped them, and I hope he didn't find out what is in the wagon. Well, let's see right now. So here we go with Dick's Adventures. Say the magic word. With me. Rickety pack, a zack, a zick. Let's have music for adventurous dick. There are rumors that the colonials are storing up muskets and ammunition on farms all around Boston. A red coat soldier, under orders to check all outgoing vehicles, stops Dick and Paul Revere on their way to Lexington. The soldier pokes around on the straw, and he finds one of the boxes under it. As he pulls it out, last picture top row, Dick exclaims, Leave that box alone, sir. The soldier orders, Open it up. Whereupon Paul Revere shouts, Liberty! Sons of Liberty! <laughs> First picture next row, the red coat throws the box to the ground. Bullets spill out. From a post close by, a squad of British regulars races out with fixed bayonets. But the Sons of Liberty are answering Paul Revere's call now. They leap from wagons and carts and stream out of all the nearby streets and alleys, ready for battle. As the Sons of Liberty and the Redcoats battle in the street, in the melee, Dick and Paul Revere escape with the precious store of arms. Hours later, last picture of the row, they are moving slowly along a quiet country road. Nothing disturbs them. Only now and then, a farmer stops his spring plowing to greet them and to receive a gift. As we see, first picture bottom row. The farmer is given a box of guns and bullets. And then, they're on their way as Dick calls back. Remember, keep your powder dry. Finally, last picture, they're nearing Lexington. Paul and Dick have stopped at a farmhouse for a cool drink of water. As they're about to continue on their way, a poorly dressed man, weary of walking, begs for a lift. Dick throws a questioning glance at Paul Revere. Well, the man could be a spy. Oh, and if he is a spy, he could tell the redcoat soldiers about the guns in the wagon... And then that could get Dick and Paul Revere into lots of trouble. Yes, it certainly could. And next week we'll find out whether he's a spy or not. This sure is exciting. Mm -hmm. Oh, look. Underneath Dick's adventures, there's Rusty Riley. Oh, yes. And trouble is really brewing there because Tappy Allardyce, who is Mr. Miles' nephew, has called Corky, the crook from the city, who's put Taffy up to all of this crooked work. Yes, and Corky and Taffy were going to steal Big Blaze. But uh, Rusty heard about it, and he hid Big Blaze in a cave. Yes, but Hillbilly is in Big Blaze's stall. And Taffy and Corky think Hillbilly is Big Blaze. And now they're trying to steal him and haul him away. So quick, let's read and see if they really do. Very well. Here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. <laughs> Taffy is about to put Hillbilly in the van, thinking it's Big Blaze. He says to Corky, well, Here he is, but I don't like this a bit. I was willing to help make Big Blaze too sick to run, but stealing, uh, that's different. Corky snarls, Yeah, quit whining. Get him in the van. And give me the ignition keys. At this moment, Rusty approaches and sees what's happening. He exclaims to himself, Golly, I was right. They're stealing Hillbilly, thinking he's Big Blaze. And then he calls out, Hey, that's not your horse. What are you doing with him? And runs toward the two men. Last picture, top row. Taffy exclaims nervously. 
Oh, great heavens, is, is that pesky kid, Rusty? Corky, who's holding a club in his hand, replies, Get the nag in the van, I'll take care of the kid. As Rusty rushes up, Corky hits Rusty in the head. And Rusty falls to the ground, unconscious. First picture, bottom row, Taffy leans over him, exclaiming fearfully, oh, Good night, Corky. You, you hit him too hard. You, you've killed him. Corky replies, Keep your shirt on. He's just out. Here, help me get him into the van. And I'll see that he don't get in anybody's way. <laughs> Meanwhile, in the house, the guest whose wallet was lost from his coat says to Mr. Miles, Oh, as I was saying, Quentin, my driver's license is in that wallet, and I don't like to use my car without it. Mr. Miles replies, Oh, yes, yes, of course, Judge Adams. Well, we'll ask Rusty. He was supposed to stay in there with the men's coats and things. And then Mr. Miles calls, Rusty? No, oh, uh, Rusty? Hmm. That's queer. He isn't here. And as Adams takes another look around on the floor, searching for the missing wallet, Goldie, Taffy's wife, who had taken the wallet herself and put it in Rusty's room, walks up to Mr. Miles and tells him, Oh, excuse me, Uncle Quentin. I couldn't help overhearing you. I thought you ought to know that I saw Rusty put something in his jacket up in his room. Mr. Miles exclaims, What? Rusty? Why, I can't believe it. Oh, isn't that terrible? Those two mean men have hurt Rusty and they're going to kidnap him. And that bad woman has put the wallet in Rusty's coat and she's trying to make Mr. Miles think that Rusty stole it. Yes, and if Rusty is kidnapped, he won't be able to be there to defend himself. No, I, I'm so worried about all well, now, don't worry too much. Maybe everything will be straightened out next week. And to take your mind off your worries, shall we read Donald Duck? Oh, oh, I just love Donald Duck, so read him. Very well, then. Turn over the page, and here we go with Donald Duck. And say the magic words with me. Squeeze them, squeeze them, squiddly chick a chat. Let Sam music to fit a quack, quack. Today, Donald is going fishing. When he gets out to the city fishing pier, he sees it so crowded with fishermen that there's no room for him. But Donald squeezes in. And he says, Mind if I edge in here, friend? And then he drops his line in the water. The man standing beside him, last picture, top row, frowns. Suddenly, Donald's pole begins to wiggle. First picture, next roll. And he exclaims, a bite, and begins to reel in his line. He discovers that all he has caught are the fishing lines of the men beside him, and he's tangled them all up. The men pick Donald up angrily and kick him away. Donald lands on his face on the pier. He sees in front of him a loose board, and that gives him a bright idea. Last picture, we see the loose board is pulled out, and Donald stands beside it, fishing through a hole in the pier. <laughs> that was clever of Donald. Yes, <laughs> now his line won't get tangled with anyone else's. <laughs> no, and I'm glad this is one time that things worked themselves out all right for Donald. <laughs> no, and that doesn't happen very often. No. Oh, look underneath, Donald. Roy Rogers, my favorite cowboy. Yes, and Roy is starting a new adventure today. And we'll find out what it is in just a minute. But first, here's that nice man with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on page five of the first section, under Donald Duck, a new adventure with Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. A yip -a yo Now, here we go with Roy and Trigger. A yip -a yo <laughs> Roy has been called to the Flying Horn Ranch by his friend, Bill Langley. As Roy rides into the corral, he calls out, Howdy, Bill Langley! His friend, Bill, who's over by the fence, exclaims, Roy Rogers, I've been keeping an eye out for you. Welcome to Flying Horn Ranch. Roy dismounts, saying, 
Came as soon as I got your wire, Bill. What's up? Wrestler trouble? Worse, Roy. Somebody's running my calves into Devil's Gorge. Roy exclaims thoughtfully. Hey, that sounds bad. Let's go out and have a look-see. Okay, but all you'll see is tracks ending at the rim. At that moment, a tall, thin, surly-looking cowboy is watching from behind the barn. He exclaims to himself, So that's Roy Rogers, huh? Eh? Hmm. He walks to his horse, climbs into the saddle, last picture top row, and gallops off, saying, If I can beat him to the gorge, I'll fix up a real welcome for Roy Rogers. First picture, bottom row, the cowboy, whose name is Legs, is reporting to an unseen man hidden behind a tree. First picture, next row. Rogers and the boss are heading for the gorge now. It's up to you to take care of that snooping cowboy. And the man replies, Don't worry, Legs. I'll handle it quietly. Meanwhile, Roy and Langley arrive at the gorge. As they rein in, Langley points out the gorge below them, which is like a long valley with steep sides. Langley says, The gorge is ten miles long, Roy. The wrestlers jump the calves off at a different spot each time. Roy replies, Seems funny, running calves into the gorge for no reason. Phew, that looks like a mile down there. Suddenly, there's a... Roy looks at the tree behind him and exclaims, an arrow. Sure glad it's sticking in the tree instead of me. Hey, what's going on here anyway, Bill? Suddenly, last picture, a figure on the rock above them calls. Ho, oh, Violet! Who invades my domain? Roy looks up to see a man dressed like a frontiersman with a leather jacket and wearing a hat with a feather in it and carrying a bow and arrows. Bill Langley exclaims, Robin Wood. <laughs> Robin Hood? That's almost like Robin Hood. Yes, and he looks something like Robin Hood, too, doesn't he? Yes, he does. I wonder whether he's a good man or a bad man. Maybe he's the man who was hiding behind the tree. Well, there's only one way to find out. Oh, I'll be here next week. Good, so will I. And now shall we see what little iodine is up to? Oh, yes, she does such funny things. <laughs> All right, then, turn over the page. And here she is right at the top, little iodine. Say the magic words with me. Eden Haddon, Hoyden Hine, music please for little iodine. Little iodine's father decides he doesn't want to go to work, that he'd rather go to the ball game. So he calls his boss and pretends he has a terrible cold and says, Oh, uh, hello, boss. <coughs> I won't be in today. I I'm sick. <coughs> and his boss replies, Okay, Henry. I hope you feel better. Henry hangs up the phone and says cheerfully, Well, he owes me some time off, but you got to play sick to get it. All right, come on, we're going to the ball game, Iodine. As Henry and Iodine drive toward the ballpark, little Iodine says, You don't think your boss will come to our house to visit you, do you, Pop? This makes Henry a little bit nervous. And he says peevishly, Ah, why, of course not. Why should he? A few seconds later, Iodine says, Maybe you ought to go by back streets in case your boss is out riding. Henry looks twice as nervous and exclaims, What? Oh, yes, um, well, maybe you're right. So he goes by the back streets. Last picture, top row. As they arrive at the ballpark and go to buy their tickets, Iodine tells her father, Better not sit near the television cameras. Somebody might see you and tell Mr. Big Dome. Henry looks about five times more nervous and replies, Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll get bleacher seats. First picture, bottom row. As they watch the ball game... Iodine suddenly tugs at her dad's coat and says, Do you have a funny feeling that somebody's looking at you, Daddy? Henry, looking about seven times more nervous, replies, Ah, huh? don't be silly. A few seconds later, Iodine asks her father, 
Does your boss ever go to ball games, Pop? Henry looks about eight times more nervous. He mops his brow and exclaims, Quit harping on me, will you? I'm not afraid of Big Dome. Whereupon Iodine suddenly jumps up and says, Look who's here! Hello, Mr. Big Dome! And Henry becomes about ten times more nervous and looks six different ways at once. <laughs> and he nearly faints. And he's so scared, he jumps up and grabs Iodine by the hand, saying, Come on, you! And heads for the car and home as Iodine exclaims, It wasn't him! It just looked like him! <laughs> Last picture, they're back home again. And Iodine has just had a spanking. And she cries. <laughs> and Henry is in bed and is saying into the phone, Oh, hello, boss. I just thought I'd call you again to tell you I really am sick. Oh, poor Henry. <laughs> he knew he shouldn't have stayed home from work and... That's why he was so nervous. Yes, and everything that Iodine said to him made him more nervous until finally he nearly had a nervous breakdown. What's that? Well, that's when you become so sick that you... Well, you break down like a car, and you can't do anything but go to bed. Oh, well, he certainly looks sick. I should say so. <laughs> oh, now is the time for that other funny, funny... <laughs> do you mean... Yes, how did you guess it was Blondie? Oh, I just knew. <laughs> and here they are on the first page of the second section of Puck the Comic Weekly, and we'll read them right away. Dagwood and Blondie. Ramafu, Ramafum, Zim Zam Zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> Blondie wants Dagwood to buy himself a new suit. But Dagwood replies, Nonsense! And he takes an old suit out of the closet, saying, This old suit of mine hanging in the closet can be fixed up like new. So he goes to work on it with a brush. Last picture, top row, Dagwood has hung the suit on the clothesline in the backyard. And he says, a nice brushing and a good airing is all it needs. And then he goes back in the house to shave. A few minutes later, as he's starting to shave, Cookie tells him to come out in the backyard to see what the pups are up to. Dagwood dashes out in the yard... And finds the pups running around playing tug of war with his suit. Then he yells, Come back with that suit! He finally catches them and takes the suit away from the pups. Then he hangs it on the line again, last picture of the row, and brushes it off again. And he looks at the pups sitting around him and exclaims, Man's best friend! <laughs> and then he goes back into the house to shave. <laughs> First picture next row, the Woodleys, Dagwood's neighbors, are looking at their garden. Unlike Mary Mary, quite contraries, theirs doesn't seem to grow. Mrs. Woodley stares at all the birds on the fence, and she tells Herb that he won't get any vegetables with all those birds around. And just then, Herb sees Dagwood's suit hanging on the line, and he exclaims, I've got an idea. And by the time you can say, if birds pick in your garden all the day, pick up a scarecrow and scare him away. Herb sets up a scarecrow in the backyard and has put Dagwood's suit on it. All of a sudden, <laughs> Dagwood, his face covered with shaving soap, is standing over Herb with a baseball bat yelling, Oh, no, you don't! And Herb replies, Well, I was just borrowing it, Dagwood. Dagwood jerks the suit off the scarecrow. The last picture of the row has it on the line and brushed off again. And he says... I'll finish my shave down here so I can keep my eye on that suit. But it's such a nice warm day that Dagwood falls asleep on the back porch while he's shaving. And first picture, last row, the sun shines on the mirror he has set up. And the mirror reflects the suit right, the sun right onto Dagwood's suit. And Dagwood sleeps on and on. A little later, Dagwood is suddenly awakened by Blondie, and he sees his suit hanging on the line in flames. And as he watches it, he sees the suit he's been trying to save burning up before his eyes. <laughs> and last picture, Dagwood's in a store, trying on a suit. And even though the suit is too big for him and looks awful, Dagwood, who didn't want to buy a new suit, says, I'll take it. Blondie, who sits nearby, tells him that he's not taking the first one 
And so we leave Dagwood in the store, where he'll no doubt be trying on one suit after another until he finds one that Blondie likes, which is why Dagwood always says, Husbands are a sorry lot. <laughs> After all the trouble he had trying to save that suit, then he was the one himself to blame for it burning up. <laughs> yes. Well, now let's turn over the page and see what other comics there are to read. All let's right. pass Ripley and Barney Google on page two. And there on page three is the Comic Weekly Club right in the middle. Oh, yes, the Comic Weekly Club. That's such fun. It certainly is because it has all those interesting games and puzzles. I read it every day in the daily paper, too. Oh, good for you. And I hope all the other boys and girls do the same thing. And now turn over to page four. And there's Jungle Jim, who has a terrific fight with a shark underwater and bravely saves some people from a shipwreck. And on page five, there's the Phantom, who's in the midst of an exciting adventure at the port of Bengali, and he discovers that his wonderful horse, Hero, has been stolen. And on the last page is Prince Valiant. Alita has made peace between King Agwar and King Hapatla, who is returning home again. And once more, we rejoin Prince Valiant, who's on his way to Rome, where next week he begins a new adventure. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice man with something interesting to say. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I've got to go now. All right, Mr. Connie Levy Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date, and a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. (laughs) 